Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here and chat with you about the Internet of Things and JavaScript. And as we all know, as JavaScript aficionados and developers, there's really never been a better time than in 2018 to be a JavaScript developer. And we know that that's true for web. We know that that's true for mobile. But increasingly, that's actually true for the Internet of Things. And today, I want to spend some time sharing with you all a few ways that JavaScript powers the next generation of IoT systems. My name is Brandon Satram. I work for Particle. Uh, you can find me online at, at Brandon Satram or email me at Brandon at Particle.io. As we get started today, I want to talk a little bit about the current state of the Internet of Things and mobile. And I want to jump all the way back to almost 100 years ago in 1926 when Nikola Tesla actually predicted the future that we live in today. Now, Tesla was talking about wireless. He was talking about wireless electricity. Uh, it was definitely all the rage at the time. But he was right in the sense that we got to where we are today because of power, because of computing. And, and those things became more ubiquitous. The future that many of these luminaries, like Tesla, predicted is the future that we are in today, which is actually kind of a cool thing to think about. And from the 60s to the early 2000s, the focus of, on, of, of technology was largely on making personal computing ubiquitous and then on the internet, and finally on mobile. But if you think back at all those trends, the whole idea was getting computers smaller and smaller and more and more common, right? Getting smaller computers in smaller devices and having more of those devices spread throughout the world. So it's really no surprise that as an industry that we would get to this point where we think, oh, well, let's just put the internet in absolutely everything. And that led to a lot of the prognostication that we have all heard and maybe gotten a little bit of tired of over the last couple of years, this idea of billions of devices online and trillions of dollars in opportunity. But the reality is that there's an immense opportunity, there's immense potential in computing in general, whatever it is, whether it's mobile or whether it's embedded systems, connected computing, the Internet of Things, whatever you prefer to call it. Now, I'm sure that many of us are familiar with this ever-present Gartner hype cycle. The IoT has a place on the hype cycle for emerging technologies, and this is where it is. It is sliding down the, down the, the slope into the trough of disillusionment. It's actually kind of crazy to think that Gartner thinks that it's going to get worse for the IoT before it gets better, because I think that many of us feel like we've heard all of the crazy stories that there are to tell. Um, if you ever are bored on Twitter, I highly recommend following the Internet of Shit Twitter account. Uh, it is actually a fantastic account that points out all of the weaknesses and all of the things about the IoT that largely are hype. But the reality is that every emerging technology goes through a cycle like this, some faster than others. Gartner will admit that some technologies end up on this cycle and then drop off completely. But many of them go through this period where you go through a trough of disillusionment to find yourself in the slope of enlightenment or the plateau of productivity, right? When hype goes beyond, when, it, when a technology goes beyond the hype and turns into a real solution, into a real set of technologies. I know that many of us have gotten tired of hearing about the IoT, but what's happening, the reason why technologies move out of this trough is because people start solving real problems. We move past internet connected toasters and refrigerators and doorbells and we move into actually solving real problems, doing things that actually matter. And that's what I want to start by talking a little bit about today is I think if you think about the IoT and you're a little disillusioned, I would encourage you to look for more examples of companies that are actually attempting to solve real problems. And I'll share a couple of them with you today. These are a few of my favorites. One is a product called the SmartFin, and this is actually a green IoT initiative from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And the idea of this, this board, this is basically a fin that you can use to upcycle an existing surfboard, and it has a couple of sensors and an IoT device inside of it. And the surfboard goes into the ocean, and it's meant to actually track board location, water temperature, the motion of each breaking wave, pH levels of the water, and more. And the reason why this is so important is because there are areas of the coastline that are very difficult for oceanographers to gather data about because the waves are very choppy. Turns out that's actually the perfect place that surfers like to go. And so this is an opportunity for surfers to actually contribute to oceanographic research and help us better the state of our oceans in the future. And that's a connected problem. That's a problem that can't be solved without connectivity, or at least not nearly as easily. Another example is OSB hives. And this is a, this is a startup that creates a product called the BuzzBox, which actually helps monitor the health and safety of beehives. 
They use a Wi-Fi module inside the board, and they also put all of their data in the cloud, and in the cloud have complex algorithms that can actually listen to the sounds of the bees in the hives to determine the health of those hives. They know, based on the sounds that are coming from the bees, whether or not the queen has died or abandoned the hive. And these, again, are things that you cannot do as easily without connectivity. And then the final one, and is probably my favorite, is EnviroFit. EnviroFit's mission is to change the ways that energy products like stoves are used in the developing world. They specifically create high-performance, environmentally friendly cook stoves that are tailored to the cultural and cooking habits of their customers in emerging and underdeveloped countries. And because these stoves are tailored, they actually need to use the sensor data inside of those. They build a stove unique to the culture, unique to the country that they're working with. That country wants to know that their investment is worthwhile, so they use monitoring to determine how the stoves are being used. They, they check the emissions on the stoves to make sure that the stoves are, in fact, actually as environmentally friendly as advertised to be. And there's a lot in all of these cases, but I mentioned connectivity. In all three of these examples, connectivity is leading these companies to solve a problem that, that would have been much harder just a few years ago. But these new forms of connectivity actually create challenges for people who have built embedded systems previously. The kind of individuals that spent their years as hardware and embedded designers definitely have a lot to learn in this new space. And this is where we, as front-end developers, as JavaScript aficionados, have opportunities to help in that space. Because the kinds of embedded systems that we built previously were very closed, self-contained systems. For instance, there was a machine on a, flop on a shop floor that may have been a very sophisticated system with complex and embedded software. And if there was a monitoring system in place, it tended to be completely localized. And when the machine broke, well, you just you replaced the machine. That was the only choice that you had. <clears throat> well, where we are today with open systems is vastly different. Because connectivity is about more than just putting a Wi-Fi or a cellular modem on a board. In a modern system, connectivity is very much about insight and control. It's about moving our ability to visualize out of the shop floor itself and into the cloud where we can monitor and control devices from a larger distance. And it's also about enabling mobile control so that we can take action on our systems from anywhere and at any time. And finally, it's about leveraging the power of the cloud to use insights and to, to, to get the kinds of insights that we could never replicate on a factory floor. The kind of insights that help us actually spot problems before they happen so that we can fix machines before they break instead of when it's too late. And this is the point that I want to underscore here, that IoT solutions are about much more than embedded hardware and software. It's not just about using microcontrollers and designing your own PCBs and writing firmware in C and C++. That is a very small piece of the puzzle, and it's where most of the opportunity, I believe, lies for us as developers. Because while most hardware engineers are perfectly comfortable in this space of hardware engineering on the side, on the left side, where they can work with microcontrollers and design, they are very less comfortable with everything on the right side of this. There are always exceptions to the rule, but for many, the IoT requires new skills beyond what those developers actually possess today. And if you think about that right, if you think about that right side, web, mobile, and the cloud, there's a common thread throughout all of those that we as developers are quite familiar with, and that is JavaScript as the common denominator. Right, this is the thing that ties all three of these types of apps together and which can really better enable the Internet of Things. And that's, what I, that's where you come in, because as a JavaScript savvy developer, there's really never been a better time to, to, to dip your toe into the IoT and to actually help solve real problems. And that's what I, what I want to spend my time talking about today is these three different kinds of apps. But if you take nothing else out of the presentation today, take this, that I believe that IoT builders are actually the real full stack developers. Here's my controversial statement for you for today. So let's actually take a look at these three different kinds of apps, starting with IoT web apps, most common. And why do you build these kinds of apps? Why are these kinds of apps actually important? Well, because they provide data aggregation, data aggregation and visualization. These are our simple dashboards and what's happening in our devices. Our devices, our closed systems of the past, may be connected to sensors and actuators. We want to know what they're doing, but it can be very difficult sometimes to really see what's going on inside those devices. The web gives us a window into what's happening on those devices. And because the web is extensible and platform agnostic, it tends to be the easiest thing that we can do to bring insight into our IoT systems. One example is a company uh, that's actually using the web to enable their IoT solution is a company named Roast that's based in Oslo, Norway. 
So they actually create a sample roaster that professional roasting companies can use to test out batches of green coffee beans before they employ their large scale roasters. Uh, this is actually a really cool product and it's an entirely self-contained unit, but they also use uh, they use the web to actually visualize the data that their roasters are seeing over time. So in addition to using the roaster on a roasting floor, you have a, a monitor that's showing exactly what's happening inside the machine itself so the company can monitor and figure out what they want to do with that. Now the context of an embedded system, there's two steps to getting your data out of those embedded devices and then doing something with it. The first part can be the most challenging part because in reality, not every embedded device that's been created in the past 30 or 40 years has an easy way for you to get that data off of it. It's only been in recent years that, con that connectivity options like Wi-Fi and cellular have been baked into a lot of microcontrollers that get, Im that get used in embedded systems. So that's sort of step A1, is that you need, to have a, you need to have an embedded system that actually can get data into the right place. And once you have that, your options are, are pretty simple. You can, use a, you can use something like MQTT to roll your own server. You can use TCP, IP. You can use TCP pub sub to get your own data into the cloud. Or you can use a vendor solution. I'll share particles in just a little bit. You can use pub sub for another solution to actually get data into the cloud. And then once you've done that, you're building the exact same kind of app that you're familiar with today. You can use Vue, Angular, React, Ember, really whatever it is to your heart's content. That's not the important part. Because the important part really is getting you the data in the first place. And so uh, I am biased, I'll share. As I shared earlier, I do work for Particle. There are other companies that have options like this in the IoT space that I encourage you to check out. I'm going to share sort of our opinions about these things because I think uh, that, they're, that they are interesting and they're worth researching more. But this example code that I'm showing you on the left side is a piece of firmware that runs on a microcontroller. But what's unique about this firmware is the use of a particle, the particle.publish command. Those commands essentially publish a cloud message that allows data on, data on a piece of firmware in, embedded, it's in, an, in an embedded system to make its way elsewhere for you to do something with. Now the other side of that is, is subscribing to messages. You can use particle.subscribe on the other side of a microcontroller, on another microcontroller, to actually respond to those messages. But you can also receive those messages from web, mobile, and in cloud applications as well. And what really matters beyond, underneath all of the layers in those APIs, is that you actually do need to have a good API, if, a good API to make all of this work in the context of web, mobile, and cloud applications. Right? This is something you can definitely roll yourself, but as, as web developers, I think what we're all most familiar with is when we evaluate third-party tools, we look for a good API. We want to have actually something that makes it easy to call into that system, to receive messages from that system, and developing the IoT is no different. It should be no different. I very rarely quote myself in previous presentations, and this one is from so long ago when I was a much younger person, uh, but I said five years ago that APIs are developer UX, and that's definitely true today in the web. It is absolutely true in the IoT, and I would expect that all of us, as we get into this space, that we would hold, we would hold our IoT solutions to the same standard. So of course I set myself up there because Particle actually does have a really nice device cloud API that I'm quite fond of. And that API makes it very easy for you to work with devices, with sensor data, with events, with fleets of products, and all of those are baked into a very RESTful API that is simple for you to work with. Now having an API makes it very easy for you, going back to the context of web applications, it makes it very easy for you to actually build things with the web for mobile and the cloud. And in the context of the web, we have a node-based JavaScript library that is designed for working with the device cloud API. It's completely promise-based. It's very easy to start with. And I'm actually going to show it off to you right now. So let me go back to my displays. Mirror. OK. So I have a web application here. Um, I actually have this connected, uh, this connected conference badge that we built for, a, for an event recently. It has a couple of things on it, buttons, a screen, what have you. But it also has a little temperature, a very small little temperature and humidity sensor on there. And that sensor is actually publishing data to the cloud every couple of minutes. Um, let me go to a, so you'll see here, let me zoom in just a little bit. Every couple of minutes it's actually reading the temperature and humidity data and it's performing a particle.publish. This is the particle device console where you get access to all events for all of your devices. You can control individual devices and et cetera. But this is sort of your window into, into your IoT devices, into your embedded systems. Let's 
excuse me. And so I'm, I'm actually pulling that data into this web application, and I also have another feature that I'll share in just a second. But the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go into my, my web application, and I have a Vue.js app that I set up for, uh, for, this, for this demo very quickly that has the sensor data, that has my where information and events. But what's notable here is I am using the particle JavaScript API. It's a very simple, I've, I've NPM installed it, I'm requiring it in my application, uh, I am passing, which you should never do, passing in my secret token, please don't write it down, I'm going to invalidate it as soon as this talk is over, uh, as well as the device ID for this badge. And then from that point, I can go off to the races. So I do a couple of things. When I actually kick off my app, I will call get temp and humidity, get where details and Twitter handle, and the way that those work I'll show you an example of one of those, is I'm calling particle.get variable. In the context of a particle device, there are actually four primitives that we provide in the API. I've already shared publish and subscribe, but there are two others, variables and functions. So variables allow you to specify sensor data to actually make that readable from a cloud application, from a mobile or web app, and then functions. And functions allow you to actually turn on actuators to actually trigger things that happen on devices as well. So I'm using the variable to get the current temperature and humidity, and I'm saving that in to my current state, and I do the same thing with my, uh, with my current where information. Now, really quick, what I'm going to try to show you here. We'll see how this works. Let me dismiss the, test, the text messages I'm getting here. I'm going to mirror my screen. All right. My iPhone has decided to switch Wi-Fi. So I'm going to mirror my screen and show you what's actually happening on another part of the badge here that has my name and Twitter, account, Twitter handle on it. Or maybe I'm not. All right, never camp on a demo that's not working, so I'm going to move on. Uh, what I can do in that case, this is an area where when I'm actually changing the where details, this is information that's coming from the badge, and I can in this case change that. If I change that to somebody else's name and change the, the Twitter handle and then I click update, what happens in the app behind the scenes is I am going to call... We'll go to update Twitter handle as an easy example. But in this case, instead of reading from a variable, I'm calling the function. In this case, the function is update Twitter. I'm passing in the new Twitter handle and then reading the promise to determine how everything happened, right? And then the last piece, in, the last piece that I shared from you, uh, that I shared with you, is event, pub publishing and subscribing. So you can not only publish events from devices and or subscribe to events from other devices, but you can actually publish, event, publish events from any other application as well. So in this case, I have an event called Spooky Start that I publish, and every single one of these devices on the table is actually listening for that event as well. And when it sees them, if this demo actually works unlike the last one, there's things going to happen. And I'm going to rush over and get that robot off the table before it rolls right off. So we'll see if that actually works. I'm going to click this event to start it. Some things are happening. This one's not. Three out of four, I'll take 75% success on those demos. Uh, and I can fire another event too to actually stop the demos from happening as well. All right. So simple example of a web application actually working in concert with an IoT application using that device cloud API, using the JavaScript API. It's really, really super simple to get started interacting with applications. Now the next piece are IoT mobile apps. And why, why do these matter? Just a second, switch my Get right back. Mobile apps matter because they provide us with visualization and control. We need that level of visualization even in the mobile form factor, but ultimately we use them because they provide us with a great deal more control. They are portable and they are ubiquitous, so they make a perfect solution for a lot of IoT scenarios. Now, I think we're used to seeing this because in the case of consumer apps and connected consumer apps, mobile phones tend to be the typical interface by which we use, uh, by which we use, uh, or by which IoT applications are built. But this is happening increasingly in the industrial world as well. 
And there are a lot of great examples of this. One of the ones that I like, and I'll share very briefly, is the Blink app. Now, Blink, spelled B-L-Y-N-K, was actually a Kickstarter project from a couple of years ago. And Blink was actually designed to give you the ability to build IoT apps from within inside of their app. They're actually an app builder app. And so what you do with Blink is you actually choose a microcontroller or the hardware that you're working with, and then you specify which functions are mapped to which pins on the device and then you create actions. You add switches and buttons and text inputs and things like that to your, to, your, to your app here. And then when you have published it, you have little buttons on the screen. So it gives you this ability, based on how you've written your firmware on the embedded side, to quickly string something together. But that doesn't represent every kind of IoT app that you might build. And in fact, there are really three kinds. Fully native apps, which tend to be very common. You can use a generic controller app like Blink. There's another called Cayenne IoT that works in a similar way. Or you can build a cross-platform app using NativeScript or React Native. Now, Particle actually provides SDKs for mobile development. So if you are choosing to go fully native, we actually have support for uh, iOS, Android, and Windows, both Objective-C and Swift. But one of the things that's, uh, that's amazing for JavaScript developers related to this is because we have full SDKs for mobile development, we also had the ability to create a, a native script plugin using those particle SDKs. And our great friend, Eddie Verbruggen, uh, with the help of, of Rob and Jen Looper and others, were really gracious in getting us and in, in working on this plugin and releasing it a couple of months ago. But this plugin, again, brings that same easy, fluent style programming interface to JavaScript, to native script apps, working with the same device cloud SDK, working with the same device cloud and the same underlying SDKs. You want me to go back, TJ, so you can take a picture? Yeah, that's yeah, fine. It's fine. You want some? Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is really exciting. I, I've been excited about this. I know that um, I know that Jen is super excited about it because she's been doing stuff with Particle and NativeScript for a while as well. Uh, and this is this has been a lot of fun for me to work with. So I'm actually going to demo this to y'all right now. Also, now I have a mobile app. That mobile app is a, shut down my web demo now. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. Okay. My mobile app does a, does a couple of things for me. So I have a NeoPixel strip inside of this pumpkin, and I can actually start flickering it. In fact, I'm gonna, let me shut this down, and I'm gonna rerun it, so while I'm talking real quick. That's the web one. So there's a couple of things going on. Let me, I'll bring this down a little bit. Okay. So this is a native script Vue application. Um, really, really big fan of Vue.js recently. I'm a recovering React developer. I'll say that. I, yeah, Vue is pretty fun. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, and so I built a simple native script Vue app that uh, just has a couple of sliders on it, and then it has a few buttons that do a few things. Oversimplification, but that's effectively what's going on here. Uh, in the case of actually using the native, script, the native script particle plugin, it's a simple matter of calling a couple of import statements, and once I've done that, getting a new instance of the particle object. I have a couple of consts that represent the device IDs for my NeoPixel strip and for uh, these, two, these two things over here that, I know this one's still not going to work again. That's all right. And then the first thing that I do is I log in. And then I am calling my local devices. So I'm calling particle list devices. This gets back from the SDK a collection of all of my devices and information about them. I'm finding the individual devices that, are, that I need in the case of this individual demo. And then I am ready to go. And so for each one of these methods, what, what I'm actually doing, as you'll notice above, when I change the value of many of my red, green, or blue sliders, what that's doing is it is calling a function called update RGB, and it's passing in a function on the NeoPixel device. What this looks like, I'm not going to show you the firmware uh, directly, but in the context of the individual app, or the individual piece of firmware, the microcontroller that's running this actually has functions, three particle functions for red, set red, set green, and set blue. And in each one of those, I pass in a value between 0 and 255 to set the red, green, or blue value on the strip. It's as simple as that. And so I can do the same thing in here. I call update RGB, and then in the update RGB function, I am calling the function on the individual device itself with that endpoint and then passing in 
the value. Now I also have a function here called start flicker. The start flicker, when I do that, will actually fire a little like Halloween orangey themed flickering animation inside the pumpkin itself. But now that that's on, what I can do is I can actually start manipulating the sliders to make the value more red or to make the value more green or anything along those lines. Really, really freak it out. Um, and again, that was as simple as me using the particle plugin. Uh, I can actually move my, uh, my dry bones servo here again. It tends to have a little bit of a mind of its own sometimes. I got the rotation wrong. <clears throat> and again, that was as simple as, let me sort of start dry bones. That was actually as simple as just calling that function name. And I've set it up to where I can actually stop it using the same function as well. Again, very simple. To be honest with you, and I'm not, I'm not, I'll, I'll publish all the firmware for this later, so if you're interested in seeing what's actually happening on the devices themselves, um, I'll show you. There's actually not really that much to it. When it comes to reading these pixel values that are passing, that I'm passing in, if I set red, set green, and set blue is really just as simple as setting a local variable that has these three values, the red, the green, and the blue value. What's actually happening inside of my firmware itself and this is what the particle function calls look like. This is setting up these local functions to actually defer when they come in. But in terms of actually doing the flickering, I'm just getting those values and then just doing some random number fun and then calling set pixel color using an Adafruit NeoPixel library that then just sets those values. This is C++. It's not overly complicated, honestly. And there's not a ton of code in here that actually makes these things happen. But the important thing, because I'm not here advocating that everybody decide to become a C++ developer, the important thing is that we were able to make a lot of this stuff happen on the back end or in, in mobile with JavaScript without having to go and directly touch that firmware. It was all set up and ready to go for us. Now, the third type of app that I want to talk about is IoT Cloud Apps. And why are these important? Well, they're important because they provide us with control, yes, but they also provide us with insight that is much harder to replicate in any other environment because the cloud has nearly infinite computational power. Now, if you've done embedded devices in the past, if anybody in here has done Arduino development, you did it four or five years ago, or even a couple of years ago, those devices were very limited in their capabilities. Embedded devices today are a lot more powerful than they were five years ago, but they are still constrained devices. We're not yet at the point where it's just that easy to run TensorFlow on a small microcontroller. You can run TensorFlow on a Raspberry Pi now, so we're getting, getting closer to that point where edge computing becomes more of a reality. But there is always going to be value in having the input of the cloud to create the kind of insight, to give us the kind of insight that we can then take actions on in an embedded environment. So a great example of this kind of cloud, easy, you know, easy development of visualization and also control in the cloud is a product is a tool called Electric I/O by Suze Hinton, and I highly recommend everybody checking it out. Uh, Electric I/O plugs into the Azure IoT Hub, so if you're getting your data into the Azure IoT Hub, like any of these particle devices, there's an easy integration for using Azure IoT, and once you've got it there, you can actually build dashboards, build controls using her node-based. Uh, application that you can either run locally or run on your own cloud. And that's an example of one of really three kinds of major apps options for building IoT cloud apps. Cloud backhaul is really one of the most common. Uh, this is where you start, right? You're actually getting all of your data into Azure, into Google Cloud Platform, into AWS. This is where you start, ingesting data from your sensors and devices and then deciding what you do with it. The second common type or option for building IoT web apps is building what I like to refer to as cloud workflow, where you're actually doing something to make decisions based on rules or logic in the cloud. You're actually doing something beyond just ingesting the data and then sending it off into a database, but you're actually making decisions based on that. And there's some great tools out there, Node-RED, uh, a tool from Particle that I'll share in just a little bit, LoSant's another great example as well. And then finally, cloud processing. And this is the heavy duty kind of stuff. This is Azure Machine Learning, IBM Watson. This is where you're actually ingesting data at scale, trying to make decisions, trying to make predictions about embedded systems, and then move forward. Now, in the case of Cloud Workflow, which I will share today, Particle has a product called the IoT Rules Engine. And this is something that we actually built on top of Node-RED and with the help of the IBM team 
uh, that works on Node-RED recently. And the whole idea here is providing an easy environment for developers, for IoT teams to be able to build solutions that don't necessarily have to be code intensive in the firmware and don't necessarily have to be completely code intensive on the web or on the mobile side as well. It's a way to actually visualize interactions through applications to make decisions, to integrate with other solutions as well. Node-RED is based on a Node.js runtime, so it's fully JavaScript that passes data around a lot of the functionality for actually doing sophisticated things inside of our IoT rules engine and Node-RED as well is by using JavaScript. And then our, part of our device client API passes everything around as JSON objects, so it's really easy to start to work with those. And this is not, a, this is not an either-or kind of decision. You're not choosing to use Node-RED or the IoT rules engine or to use Azure or use the Google Cloud Platform. Node-RED, we have built-in integrations that actually makes it easy to massage your data, to make decisions, to take action, and then pipe that data into another place, to put it into Influx or into Mongo or another location as well. And that's the last demo that I want to show you all today, is actually taking a look at the rules engine. So I have a couple of different examples here that I want to show. I showed you already that my badge is actually pushing, um, is actually pushing data. Oh, that's not good. What is that? Let's hope I get better ones down here. Let me clear that out. So <clears throat> the advantage of the publish and subscribe semantics on, the, on devices is that, as I mentioned earlier, you can use those absolutely anywhere. In this case, we can actually subscribe to messages inside of our devices as well, inside of uh, a, a rules engine application. And so a few important context, uh, context items to share here is that on your, your canvas here, this is what's referred to as a flow, right? So this is a series of actions that take place based on, based on sensor data, and you're doing something with that data and exiting out the other side. Every individual block is called a node, and that's where the individual work of the application actually happens. So in this case, for my environmental sensors, I'm looking for an event called end sensors. Every two minutes, that's coming in. When I get it, I want to do something with it. I'm going to actually convert the payload to JSON. It comes in as a JSON string, so I will make that full on JSON, and I will log, I will debug the payload so that I can take a look at it. But then I can do a couple of interesting things. One is I can actually use these UI, UI nodes that allow me to create a very simple dashboard that shows me what sort of information I'm getting about my devices. So I can log the temperature and humidity. And this is a very, very simple set of semantics that allow me to create gauges and charts and graphs using the data that actually comes in. So I specify the value format, message.payload.temp. That's actually the temperature value that's coming in. And same thing with humidity. And then I create a graph. And what I get on the other end is I actually get very easy. I didn't have to write any of this myself in the context of someone who's trying to prototype an easy, quick and dirty IoT application. The rules engine actually makes it very simple for me to get dashboards up and see what's actually going on with my application. But there's more. There's more that I can do. It's not just about getting data in from devices, but also actually being able to control devices and do something out on the other end. So I have another example here where I'm actually run, I'm, I'm running a command every five minutes. Every five minutes, I'm triggering a new flow here. And what I'm doing is I can, I'm actually going to the Open Weather Map API to get the forecast for Boston. This comes to me back as a JSON object, so I know that I can work with it easily. So I get, the, I get the forecast for Boston, I convert it to a JSON object, and then I'm doing a couple of different things. One is I actually am adding to my UI piece, and I'm, I, I added a, uh, what's called a template node, which actually allows me to do s simple Angular style templating inside of the rules engine. And I can specify, I want to get the weather description, and I'm, just, I'm basically just going to provide some information about the current conditions of the application, or of the, the weather in the current location. So you'll see that's here. Currently broken clouds in Boston, outside temp is 49, humidity is 45%. The rules engine makes it really easy for me to create those sorts of, uh, those sorts of things in my app. But I'm also going to do something a little bit more sophisticated, and this is where the actual JavaScript programming comes in. I mentioned earlier, function nodes are written in JavaScript. So this is when, again, we have an opportunity to contribute to the IoT here. And so what I'm doing in this case is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look at the, the, the temperature that comes in from the payload. And if the temperature is under 40 degrees, I'm going to pass a message that it's cold. If it's, if it's between 40 and 80, it's nice. Otherwise, it's going to stay as hot. And that payload ends up going into a publish event. 
that publish event is a local temp event that this individual device is looking for. And so when this device hears that event, it's actually going to turn on the NeoPixel strip based on the color command that I gave it, or based on whether I said it's hot, it's nice, or it's cold outside. So if I redeploy that flow, and then go to my debug node and ignore the strange messages that are coming along. So you'll see that I passed the payload of nice, right? That actually turned the light, the NeoPixel strip on here green. That in my firmware uh, signifies, hey, it's nice outside, it's green, you can go outside, the grass is growing. But the reason why this is interesting and important for us as IoT developers is let's say that I decide, actually 49 degrees is not nice, I'm from Texas, it's still friggin' cold, okay? <laughs> I'm not going outside after this. I'm staying inside until I leave for the airport tomorrow. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna change this rule to say, okay, if it's under 50, it's cold. And if it's between 50 and 80, it's nice. And I'm gonna redeploy that. And then now you'll see, okay, it's 49, the NeoPixel strip has turned blue. I was able to make a change to my app and how it functioned without having to go in and recompile and reflash firmware to the device. I was able to use the rules engine to help make that happen. And again, we are, powerful JavaScript developers that can actually contribute to this space by using these kinds of tools and technology. So, as I close today, I want to spend a few minutes talking about this idea of real IoT. I mentioned earlier that we were trying to solve real problems to get the IoT out of this trial of disillusionment. Um, and I understand that while I did that, within a few minutes, I was actually showing you some silly demos, some Mario Halloween themed demos, uh, that actually made this whole thing work. So you could potentially sit back and say, well, hey, you're not solving real problems, you're just playing around. Um, I feel pretty strongly that the part of how we solve real problems in this world is by playing and by understanding how these things work, by trying to do silly things for ourselves, for our kids, whoever it might be. Because if you strip all these individual demos away, what actually is behind the scenes on all of these is motors and servos and displays and LEDs, the kinds of things that actually get used in real IoT systems. And by understanding those things even through play, we can understand how they're used to solve real problems as well. So my encouragement for you all today as we, as, as we break, as we leave, is to consider becoming a fuller stack developer and taking your JavaScript world, your JavaScript skills into the world of IoT. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.